While the Chevy Corvette has long laid claim to the title of America's favorite sports car, in no small part due to consistent production and manufacturer support for the brand through economic and regulatory conditions that robbed sports cars of their, well, sportiness, the competition history of Corvette was rather fractured at best. Privateer teams had occasionally built and raced Corvettes since the first generation was introduced, but a factory-supported effort to challenge the likes of Porsche and Ferrari in the top echelons of GT racing never truly materialized. This finally changed with the debut of the fifth-generation Corvette, with GM deciding to finally throw their support behind a global racing effort in partnership with Pratt & Miller, an engineering firm with whom the Detroit automaker had previously collaborated on their intrepid RM1. An unusual early 1990s design that ran counter to conventional wisdom and its rivals in the GTP field by focusing on downforce at the expense of durability, high drag, and relatively low top speed. Some reports indicated downforce approaching 5 tons, approximately 5 times the downforce generated by a Ferrari Enzo. Nevertheless, this unconventional approach worked well for the team, granting a win, six poles, and six fastest laps from 32 starts by drivers such as Wayne Taylor, Al Unser Jr., and Perry McCarthy, later distinguished as the Stig who drove off an aircraft carrier, and positioning the car to significantly influence future vehicle designs until a brutal crash at Watkins Glen spooked potential customers and ensured the continuation of the contemporaneous conventional wisdom. Nevertheless, the willingness of Pratt and Miller to challenge orthodox practices and take risks in pursuit of victory made them compelling partners, and following the launch of the C5 road car in 1997, GM approached them to help build and campaign a racing version in the GT class of the FIA GT Championship and GT slash GTS in the American Le Mans series. Ready for the first year of the ALMS in 1999, its first race was at the 1999 24 Hours of Daytona, the traditional season opening race for the American racing year. The C5R was initially powered by an uprated, KTEC built 6.0 liter version of the new LS1 V8 that debuted with the road going C5 in 1997. However, less than halfway through its first season, this was replaced with an even larger 7 liter power plant, rated at 610 horsepower and 570 pound feet of torque, and making, in the opinion of this commentator, one of the finest sounds of any early 2000s racing car. Power arrived, as expected, at the rear wheels through a manual gearbox for most of its racing career, a 5-speed until 2002, when it was upgraded to a 6-speed, and its final season in 2004, it received an X-Track 6-speed sequential gearbox. As with most GT vehicles, only the barest structural elements were shared in commonality with the road car. While the glass hatchback of the road car was replaced with perspex and remained nominally transparent, a firewall behind the driver obscured any erstwhile rear visibility. The pop-up headlamps were replaced with flush-ish mounted units, and the normal aerodynamic improvements of a rear wing and front and rear diffuser completed the package. In its first outing of the 24 hours of Daytona, the Corvette suffered the traditional teething difficulties of a new platform, finishing 34 laps behind the Porsche that won the class. These struggles continued throughout the 1999 season, partly remedied by the aforementioned 7-liter engine, but not sufficient to score any victories, contending themselves with two second-in-class finishes at Sears Point and Laguna Seca. The year 2000 brought improved fortunes, with the duo of Corvettes proving themselves strong competitors against the dominant Dodge Vipers throughout the season, and earning race wins at Texas Motor Speedway and Petit Le Mans. However, it was 2001 when things really started to click for the team. Starting the season with an outright win at the 24 Hours of Daytona, GM and Pratt and & Miller embarked upon their first full-season ALMS campaign, notching six class victories, including a repeat at Petit Le Mans, an additional vic class victory at Le Mans. The C5Rs continued to find racing success in subsequent seasons, with their only consistent challenger coming in the guise of a pair of pro-drive-run Ferrari 550s, which came on in strong form for their only full ALMS season in 2003 breaking Corvette's three-peat of previous victories at Petit Le Mans and dashing their hopes of a similar three-peat at Le Sarth. Presumably content with this success, ProDrive promptly dropped out of the ALMS in 2004, granting Corvette virtually undisputed command of the GTS category. Although ProDrive did return to defend their previous class victory at Le Mans, Corvette rested not upon their laurels, avenging their loss to bring the team a third win on the green fields of France. 
The 2004 season also saw the C5 used as a racing testbed for technologies and innovations that would see implementation on the upcoming C6R, including an air conditioning system, rare for racing cars at the time, and a rear camera system to return some of the visibility lost through the addition of the aforementioned firewall. Although retired by Pratt & Miller at the end of the 2004 season to make way for the new C6R, several C5s were sold to privateer teams starting in 2003, extending their competitive lifespan in the ALMS, FIA GT Championship, and numerous regional competition series through 2007, ending a competition career that saw 55 factory-supported races entered, yielding 31 wins and 50 overall podiums, a 56% win rate but a whopping 91% podium rate, with a far greater number of privateer entries and victories for which it is difficult to track down accurate statistics. As with the Audi R8 mentioned in the first video, C5Rs do make occasional appearances at historical races in the United States and abroad. For today's call to action not involving the three sacred words of YouTube, as we're going to call them from now on, why not pick up a fiction book that you've had on a shelf for a while and have either been meaning to read or remember enjoying several years ago? I recently read Jurassic Park and am now about halfway through The Lost World by Michael Crichton and have been enjoying them far more than I remember enjoying sort of you know, popular mass-market fiction books. Well worth a read if you've never taken the time.